Okay, so I think I should be live. Um, hey, everybody. Um, before I get into my talk proper, um, I figured I'd show you all a small kind of overview of the sections that I'm talking about. Um, and also, like, just as a caveat, this will most be, mostly be the kind of talk where I'm talking. So the slides don't matter as much as the words. Um, so what I mean to say is basically feel free to get comfy and grab your teacup and lean back and maybe close your eyes. And with that out of the way, well, here we have the, the setup. Introduction, background details, summary, and final observations. So I'm Alexander Cobley. I usually go by CBLGH on the net, and I'm an independent peer-to-peer -peer researcher. And that intro kind of feels like a, the start of the like, technologist anonymous meeting. But what I mean is I work on a peer-to-peer -peer group chat called Cabal with some of my friends. And I'm part of a few decentralized communities, like the uh, Mervay community, which is an artist collective on the internet, and the wonderful Secure Skullbutt community. What I'll be talking about for like the next 20 minutes or so is the research that I undertook as my master's thesis um, and the resulting system, which was the outcome of that, the name of which is TrustNet. So TrustNet in brief, it's basically a system for interacting with and managing computational trust. And what this means in practice is that you can designate people you trust and how similar you consider that they are to you, with the end goal being to automate and uh, basically delegate decision-making to your most trusted friends. Uh, so yeah, maybe why you're thinking now. And the reason I started this research was well, one, because I need to do a thesis project, uh, but it's also been on my mind because the peer-to-peer -peer chat system that I mentioned, Cabal, didn't at the time have uh, any moderation capabilities, but it does now. And since Cabal is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed chat, implementing group-based moderation is kind of a non-trivial problem. The problem being that in a peer-to-peer uh, -peer distributed system, how do you decide who may hide posts for the entire group and who may not? So if anyone can hide for the entire group, then so may abusers. And on the other hand, like if only the initiator, the one who created the group, can hide, well, how do you decide who's the initiator? This is kind of a tricky problem in a peer-to-peer -peer distributed system. And the problem is a big rabbit hole, especially if you try to impose traditional centralized moderation on top of it. So what peer-to-peer -peer systems typically do in this case then, um, is they make moderation an individualistic concern everyone for themselves. And that kind of just didn't really sit right with me because I think we can take care of our friends and let our friends take care of us, that together we can make sure our common spaces are welcoming and sustainable and that we can mitigate abuse without having to burn out people in the roles of dedicated sysadmins uh, or chat moderators, chat moderators, which are time consuming and thankless jobs. Um, I also think that this type of arrangement of having dedicated mods and admins is a fragile foundation. Because like I've, I've been part of old school forums and I've seen them collapse when the one person who's maintaining the server just like ran out of time or lost interest. And most recently I've seen Mastodon drama cause instances to shut down, which effectively scatters the entire community of friends that was gathered around this uh, system. So yeah, you might be thinking, that's great, but like, how do you actually do this kind of thing? And the insight I had after thinking about this problem for quite a bit in the fall and summer of 2018 was that a subjective moderation system can mitigate a lot of the problems. So what I said in the introduction that you can designate who to trust and moderate on your behalf and how similar you think they are when it comes to, uh, how similar they are to you when it comes to the task of moderation, well, you can kind of use this and concretely it means that well we have one assignment of trust from one person to another determining like yeah, well, how similar they are to you what this means is that in a subjective moderation system different people may have uh, kind of a different view of the chat system um, but typically it just means that we have different groups of people friends which rely on each other to kind of help hide abusive participants or spammers or just obnoxious people in general. And I mean, today in feed-based uh, chat systems like Twitter or Facebook or whatever, we already have slightly different views of the system. It's just that in this kind of case where you decide who, trust, who to trust and your friends decide who to trust, well, you're in more 
control kind of, of what you get to see. It also means that everyone is empowered to perform moderation actions while also sharing and spreading out the, moder the, the burden of moderating together with others that you trust. So uh, the details of Trustnet then, well, so Trustnet consumes a list of these trust statements I was just talking about, and um, it uses them to create a trust graph from me to you to your friends and so on, where each link between two people is a statement of saying, yeah, I trust this person. The strength of the link between the two people is what I was referring to as similarity and judgment. It's, I call it a trust weight in my thesis. And ba it basically determines the transitivity or recommendation power of the, pe the person being trusted. So if I trust you a lot and you trust your friend a lot, then I transitively trust your friend through you. Um, but let's take an example of trusting someone with a low similarity because I might trust a close friend to block trolls who are mean because, well, my friend is my friend and I think they're a decent person. But I might not really trust their judgment in who they recommend for me to trust. Um, so what I can do then is I can assign them a low similarity. And why I would do this is because, well, this friend is just a bit too trusting for my tastes. Maybe they assign trust to everyone and I don't really want to bring in that transitivity into my trust graph. Um, so that's how I kind of allow people who use Trustnet to discount uh, the transitivity of people who still want to be able to help you moderate stuff. They can still block the trolls it's because I trust them, even if I think we're not that similar in who to recommend. Uh, but having this trust graph is nice and all, but the kind of the devil is in the details of this. Like how do you convert a wide spanning trust graph into automated and delegated moderation actions? Because there are likely people in the trust graph who block in a manner that I'm not, a, that I'm not comfortable with because we just, we're not that similar. There also might be malicious people who trick someone on the far edges of the trust graph to be trusted. And suddenly, if you don't make any distinctions in the trust graph, uh, you have this malicious person who can uh, abuse their newly gained powers. Um, but like, regardless, these cases, it's not likely that they would be someone that I trust directly. Because why would you delegate to someone you think will do a bad job? Or, I mean, I guess you could get fooled, but you'll probably notice that quite quickly. Um, so that kind of means that there is a distinction or a cutoff point where we have two groups. This group are consists of people that I trust to kind of, I mean, I trust their judgment and I trust them to moderate. And then we have this other set of people who are in the trust graph, but whose judgment I don't trust. I don't want to delegate the task of moderation to them. The way Trustnet solves this pro uh, problem is by processing the trust graph and deriving subjective rankings from my point of view, and then using a clustering technique to make a cut in the derived rankings. Uh, and the cut in the rankings basically separates the two groups, people I trust to delegate actions to and people I don't trust for delegation. So everyone you trust directly is in this uh, trusted group. Because I mean, you trust them, you've made a decision that they're trustworthy, even if you kind of don't trust them for recommendations. Uh, also in the trusted group is a portion of the people whom you trust indirectly or transitively. And they're there because of the similarity measure I was talking about earlier. Because let's consider people you trusted directly where you gave them a high similarity in judgment. Basically, this means that you think they have a good taste in who to recommend. If some of these directly trusted trust tastemakers trust the same person who you don't trust directly, then this person will likely get a high trust ranking and they will be included in your trusted group. So in this way, Trustnet kind of acts as like a organic discovery mechanism, but one which you can control directly by your trust assignments and your similarity and your circle of uh, So kind of at the core of Trustnet is this algorithm called Appleseed, which is what consumes the trust, the trust graph and churns out these rankings, which are subjective from the point of view of, for example, me. And Appleseed was a direct outcome of the popularity of peer-to-peer -peer research in the 90s until the mid 2000s. And peer to peer around then was a really hot research area in uh, the computer science portions of academia at least. And one academic offshoot of the peer to peer craze was the promise of the semantic web. And the semantic web was basically the following. 
So imagine we all have our own spaces on the internet where we put up resources and documents of various kinds. And imagine how beneficial it would be for kind of the promotion of human knowledge if these data points could be automatically scraped and categorized. The semantic web was basically this a web in which various texts and resources would be categorized and interlinked to their definitions, allowing web semantics and therefore meaning to be automatically crawled and explored. This automatic crawling would be enabled through markup, such as RDF or the Resource Description Framework, as a way to represent the meta of the resources. So Appleseed then was devised as an algorithm by which the semantic web could be crawled and refined along pathways of trust. The idea is that actors in this web would have defined which other actors they regard as trustworthy, basically using a scale of zero to 100, with zero meaning no trust, but importantly, no trust is separate from distrust, which is another beast entirely. And 100 signifies absolute trust. In the sense of this kind of tangled web of trust and transitive trust, to know how one actor stands in relation to another from my subjective point of view, Appleseed is used. So what Appleseed does, uh, kind of technically, is it iteratively distributes a finite amount of energy from the starting source, for example, me, along the pathways of trust for a number of steps away from me. So along my direct trust assignments and to my friends' direct trust assignments and so on, until basically all of the energy has been dis uh, distributed. The way you kind of can figure out that it's been distributed is if you compare two iterations and the change in uh, uh, energy that's been assigned is less than some threshold value, which is really small. But the way I kind of like to describe and think about Appleseed is in term of a physical metaphor. So let's remember that we basically want to find out the subjective trust rankings of some person, for example, me, and figure out how people relate to each other regarding trust in my network, which consists of direct and indirect friends. So we basically want to figure out if Alice has more trust than Bob from my perspective. So the metaphor is the following. Imagine you have a big tub of water, say 200 liters. And in front of you is a network of interconnected holes in the ground. The holes are connected to each other with tunnels of varying diameter. Um, you pour the tub of water into the hole closest to you and it sloshes around from one hole to the next along the tunnels and does so for a while until it basically and finally settles down. And after it's settled down, you see that the holes closest to you have ended up with more water, which is also true for the holes which have had more tons leading into them, particularly those holes which have had uh, tunnels with larger diameters leading into them. And the holes farther away from you, however, have which have many intermediary holes until they're reached, have ended up with less of the water. So in this metaphor, Basically, the holes in the ground are people in the trust graph. The tunnels connecting each pair of holes is the trust weight between those two people, the similarity in judgment. And the top of water is the finite amount of energy which Appleseed injects into the trust graph and iteratively redistributes in order to figure out the rankings of the members of the trust graph. So trustnet, like let's kind of summarize what I've been talking about. People can assign whom they trust and how similar they are in the given area of trust. I've been talking about this kind of trust area of moderation. This gives us a trust graph, which Appleseed then uses to derive a ranking. In the ranking, the people with the most trust are at the top of the rank, and people with the least amount of trust, but still trusted, are at the bottom. We then cut this ranking into two, yielding a subset of the list, which is regarded as the most trusted people of the graph. This group is is used to uh, automate decision making and delegate actions. And we can kind of envision a few use cases for how to make use of this trusted group. In the moderation uh, aspect, like for a chat system, it could be used to mirror the moderation actions performed by the trusted group. But you could also use this group in other ways. Like one use is you could have your chat system and uh, you could toggle on and off the view so that you only show messages from the people in the trusted graph, which can make sense when you're kind of having a really shitty mental health day and you just like want to see stuff from your friends and not risk anyone writing something uh, that's like really triggering. Another use could be to use the list to drive whom to follow in a feed style social media application. So basically you have this group of trusted people and then you remove the people that you're already following 
and the people that are left are people that well your friends have said that they trust quite a lot but if we kind of step away from this area of moderation because trustnet is agnostic to the area of trust it's supposed to model um, we can kind of think about another area which would be music recommendations where trust between participants would signify a similarity in music taste the trusted group could then be used to create a feed of recommendations from the tastemakers you've defined as being most similar to you so this kind of way of using trustnet is less computation intensive than current machine learning techniques uh, like collaborative filtering and you also require less data um, it's also more transparent and gives you agency to directly control your own recommendations instead of just trying to uh, garden this like algorithm by selectively clicking like on stuff and not really like knowing what's going on um, but we're kind of getting to the end of my talk and I wanted to kind of veer off in a item that I've been thinking about so let's step back from the details of Trustnet and I want to just outline these observations that have been on my mind because I think uh, where we're at today with our digital lives and the internet and our networks is like an overfull glass of water um, precariously prevented from spilling over due to some weak surface tension that's barely keeping things together. On the one hand, we have this trend towards a monopolistic internet, which is true in terms of increasing the set of browsers, largely due to the extreme scope creep and pro proliferation of complexity, which we've allowed to ferment. We also have a con consolidation of online po uh, power brokers mediating our everyday lives through the groups and connections that have been enabled by social media. These surveillance capitalist platforms have been designed for basically causing people to emotionally spiral downwards in order to increase engagement and therefore ad revenue and sales of user prediction data. On the other hand, however, we have community projects which are starting to mature from small puddles of funding and care and friendship which have been cultivated over the years. We have things like Secure Scuttlebutt that I'm part of, which recently secured news on the EU in order to push the protocol forward. And we also have Cabal, which is the project I work on with my friends, which is approaching maturity in terms of stability and feature set. And there are also like tons of projects as well out there. And well, these communally developed projects will allow communities to continue to exist independent of the survival of any venture funded company which i mean all typically either go get bust like go bust or get bought up or are revealed to be exploiting user data i mean i mean there's also a fourth option which is it just cost way more than any community can kind of actually uh, put up with um so i think I'm trying to say is like we're on this cusp of new forms of organizing and coexisting so like with trustnet i think we're starting to see ways in which we can rely on each other and that we have for one another in order to solve common problems together and in more socially sustainable and resilient ways and i think these new nascent forms of organizing will help connect us online but also bring us into spaces offline letting us see each other and start to collaborate in earnest the caveat or condition or warning uh, for organizing will be available for groups that care about human rights and equality, which is good, but it will also be available for people and groups who do not, which is really frightening. So I want to kind of end this talk by encouraging everyone to think about how we can make sure the groups we're involved with can help us thrive, while also at the same time considering the consequences that they can have and how to mitigate those. And typically, the best kinds of mitigations aren't technical in nature, but social. So like, I just want to end on this note that I think we're ent entering really interesting times, as well as we're seeing the start of a new movement of communal projects. And that was basically all that I had to say. I think we'll do some questions. If you want to read uh, more about Trustnet's details, you can see this blog post that's linked there. Um, and also linked there is the code for both Trustnet and Appleseed, which I implemented in JavaScript, and also my 103-page thesis, which, in case you want even more details. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Alex. Um, we have some questions in the chat. 
Um, so there's one posted already by Comedy, which says, do you think if sites aired more on the side of ephemerality that moderation might not be so urgent? And then I'll prompt people to ask more questions while you answer that. Okay. Um, well, I still think like, even if you have an ephemeral site, like for example, Twitter doesn't really need to have these archives that stretch back until it, it was founded. It still hurts tons if you have someone who's following you uh, or just abusive and just like, even if, I mean, everything that's ever been said to me that's been harmful has been ephemeral. It only lasts for that second. Uh, so in that case, I would rather have my friends kind of help keep track of that. That's kind of what I think Twitter and these kinds of social media lack today is that, well, if I see someone being kind of abusive to my friends, I can't just like hide them preemptively because it, it hurts me way less to see someone who I like being called a bad word and hiding that than it does for the person being the called word to see it. Um, so uh, yeah, I think ephemerality is good for some reasons, definitely, um, but Moderation is still an important concern. Let's see if there are any um, other questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, how long did it take you to come up with this? What was the process like? Yeah. Okay. So, well, I was in like, yeah. So 2018, I was thinking about Trustnet. I wasn't thinking about Trustnet. I was thinking about Cabal and how do we solve this? Um, it took basically like that summer and that fall of just here and there thinking about how can we get moderation into this um and i mean the idea was like okay i guess we can do it su subjectively because i was hanging out on skullbar a lot and subjectivity was a big kind of founding principle of skullbar and continues to be uh and i think i was also talking with friends on this topic of like liquid democracy where you can kind of delegate very liquidly who you want to allow to vote for you. So it was kind of similar in that sense. Um, so I had the basic idea, but then I kind of, when I started in implementing it, I ran into this problem of, okay, you have the trust graph, but how do you decide where to make a make the cut? Uh, and that took a bit of time as well. Uh, so yeah. Awesome, thank you yeah. for that. Um, I see. Gervin is typing something in the chat, so let's maybe wait a few seconds for that. Yeah, sure. I guess in the meantime, this is implemented with Cabal right now? Actually, so Cabal has an approach which is uh completely parallel to Trustnet because it, it turns out that me and Substack were working on this independently at the same time. So at the end of, I think, May last year or something, he started on an implementation, um, like a work in progress PR of a very similar system to this. And my research into this kind of influenced at least my approach into finishing up that PR with uh, Kira, Substack, Nick Warner. Um, of Cabal. And we also got uh, money from Mozilla uh, as a result of a grant application to finish implementing the PR. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't actually have Trustnet, but I've been thinking about using Trustnet for things like, well, if we add uh, image sharing, for example, maybe you only want, maybe you only want to show, show avatars from people you trust uh, or automatically download images that people upload from people in your trust net. Um, so yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, yeah. Thank you. There's a question here from Gerben, which says, "Thinking of liquid democracy, which is mainly for hierarchical graphs, I think. What do you observe slash imagine graphs to be shaped like? Having many supernodes, hubs, etc., or being more homogeneous?" Mm. So I guess it's, it's always really hard to kind of make a prediction of what things will be like in practice. Um, the way uh, I've thought about this is basically, you'll always have a community of people who you've interacted with over the years in these kind of chat systems like Scuttlebutt. And you can kind of have, in Scuttlebutt, you can see who blocks whom. 
which has given me an intuition for, well, I think this person maybe blocks a bit too much for my taste, but I have these other people that I, I know block in my taste. Um, so I think it will be kind of a almost decentralized federated model where you have small pockets of people who trust each other, as well as maybe some super nodes, like for example, in uh, SSB's case. Well, I mean, I think everyone pretty much trusts Dominic because he's just a really cool guy. Uh, so you might have some of these like influencers who are really trusted. Uh, otherwise, yeah, small pockets of people who you've met directly and you kind of know their sensibilities um, with overlap over different groups of people. But yeah, that's a great question. Awesome, thank you. So uh, do you have any last thoughts to share uh, since it doesn't look like there's more questions yet? Um, I guess like, yeah, I think uh, people should think a bit about what they kind of, what they can contribute to this kind of new movement of communal projects of like Skullbutt or Cabal or Codebox. And basically just, if you feel that you're kind of aligned with what these projects are trying to do, I mean, try to use them with friends and give feedback to people, see if you can contribute. I think we're really at the start of a new kind of a peer-to-peer -peer movement again. Like we're getting back to that state where the excitement is getting really high, like it was in the mid uh, end of the 90s and mid 2000s. Um, so yeah, just to encourage people to try out the things that are actually being built. Uh, so yeah, awesome. thanks for having me. Oh, there's actually a couple oh. more questions if you have time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Sweet. So from Moss Kalik, I don't know if I got that name right. Um, it's interesting how you're attempting to converge the view of the feed, which is more time-based, versus clusters, which tend to take up internet space. Considering the ephemeral question, do you see a possibility to implement a type of sliding window to tune slash moderate content? Hmm. Not really sure what the the question asker means by a sliding window in this case. Um, uh, if they, I guess, like if they want to provide more context, that would help. Uh, I can guess at what they mean. Like I've I've talked about this subjective moderation kind of idea with a few people, and one thing that comes up is um, there's always the the case that if you delegate moderation actions, I mean, which we already do in cases like Facebook groups, Twitter, and stuff, uh, people might be hidden uh, and then just continue to be hidden for all the rest of time. So you kind of have a sliding window there where you could kind of get prompted to reevaluate, like, okay, is this person, like, should they still be hidden or, or were they just being, uh, were they just like spamming because they were drunk or something? Um, but I'm, I'm not really sure if that's what the person meant. Cool. Um, well, maybe then we can take that into the chat more if you are available for that. Um, um, yeah, I can try to log on. Cool. Awesome. So thank you so much for coming. So um, yeah, feel free to like last sentence, and then um, we'll take a short break and then start on our next presentation. All right, last sentence. Well, uh, our networks is amazing and everybody should uh, support them. Have a good one.